Thank you. So first, a little bit about LinkedIn. Um, I work in the New York office of LinkedIn. Um, the main headquarters is in Northern California, uh, but we have a growing team in New York about a, of about 100 engineers at an office in the Empire State Building with about 1,000 employees total there. Um, a URL that, for the image that's a good thumbnail image for that page so that that information can be used by front-end services, UI, to create this nice little panel that you end up seeing uh, on the platform with an image and a clickable link. Um, and so the other parts of LinkedIn will use this metadata to render this panel. And also the metadata uh, serves as uh, information that feeds into other systems downstream from Babylonia that will analyze further the contents of that page, looking for, for example, companies that are mentioned in the news, other members that are mentioned in the news, um, and trying to understand a little bit more about what each article is about, uh, so that to see who other members might be that are interested in that same, uh, in that same content. So the content ingestion system, uh, we extract the data from the meta pages. We are the source of truth reference for all the other systems of LinkedIn about third party uh, web pages um, and again feed into the, into the back end. And what the system looks like in a diagram form is you have the service Babylonia. <clears throat> it uses storage as a, which is the database, which since this is about database migration, it started off being Oracle. <clears throat> and two things come from this. You have this um, arrow going down here that we're calling data change events. So the, uh, when we write to the Oracle database or update a row in the database, that generates an event uh, that uh, other subscribers can listen to. So if you have a service that is interested in uh, what the latest URLs are that are being shared on LinkedIn, you can plug into those events. And also we get a snapshot of the database that is put onto an offline store, ETL to HDFS, where it can be processed further. So what happens is you have other services that are downstream of Babylonia. Um, the ones that are processing that stream of events are what we call nearline because uh, they are processing continuous stream of, of events, but not in a kind of real-time way that is uh, uh, useful for, for example, uh, a, a responding to a, an, a UI with the kind of uh, responsiveness that you need, um, uh, but not as a long-term long uh, back, back-end offline process, which tends to process the database as a whole in batches, uh, taking inputs of data sets and producing outputs of data sets. And we use these various technologies that I put here, that some, many of them are open source, uh, and some of them are also have been developed at LinkedIn, like Kafka and Samza, um, and are, have been open sourced by LinkedIn. So we're migrating from Oracle. So just a couple of facts about um, Oracle in our situation, of course, a fully relational database. Uh, we have Databus is the uh, which is an open source uh, platform that has been created at LinkedIn, which is used for generating this stream of data change events from the database. Um, we have an ETL process that produces a snapshot of the database uh, for offline consumers, and uh, the way we store information about the web pages is uh, one row per page, so it's not a lot, there's no joins or relational uh, queries that are done um, in, this, uh, in this context. And mainly, Babylonia is the only service that reads or writes uh, to this database, although we'll see it was not the only one at the beginning of this process. Most of the interaction with the database happens through RESTly endpoints, which if you attended uh, yesterday's talk by Min, you'd hear all about uh, RESTly and, and Pegasus and how that um, platform works. So now what is Espresso? What is this, the database that we're migrating to? So Espresso is different uh, from, uh, from a traditional relational database in that it is a NoSQL style, so it's non-relational. Um, it is distributed and scalable, which means that we can um, get 
um, more performance out of it by adding, uh, adding more uh, machines to it, um, which is uh, really maintained by the Espresso team. So for us, we can request additional database services and that translates into something that the Espresso team delivers for us as opposed to uh, something that uh, the Oracle uh, DBAs would, would be delivering to us. And the form is now not exactly like a row, it is a document which in, the, in this case is defined in Avro, so it's JSON. Uh, you have um, a, a data structure that's sort of a nested hierarchical list of types or um, records within records. Um, and it's all indexed by certain key fields um, or where the primary key determines which partition the, the data belongs in. Um, but it isn't, you can't uh, do a fully uh, relational query like you can on an Oracle database. You're mainly retrieving items by key. So the question is, if we had a working system, why would we want to migrate? So one of the problems that we had with Oracle is that because of the size of the table and the way it was set up, say, um, there was regular maintenance that needed to be done on the database, which involved downtime on the, on the database, um, which meant that we had to, since the database was replicated between different data centers, we'd sometimes have to take a data center offline uh, twice a year for a certain amount of time while they did this maintenance, so that was undesirable. Um, it was also more expensive to maintain the current setup that we had with Oracle, and strategically, Espresso was the platform that systems were using within LinkedIn, and so we wanted to join up with them and, and become part of uh, sharing that same platform. Uh, having, uh, having more things work the same way makes, uh, makes it easier for, uh, for them to, um, to manage that, that resource. And um, we'll see also how the fact that it is Avro documents as opposed to Oracle Rose made things better from certain standpoints from the developer's point of view. So let's look back again at the overall system diagram and talk about the data formats and where this, where this plays in and why the migration was a good idea. So you have uh, um, articles being represented in Babylonia in the form of a Pegasus object. This is the representation form for RESTly. So RESTly allows you to define the object in, in a JSON format and it also has a Java object form. So that's the, that's the, the internal representation within Babylonia. And it's very similar to the Pegasus representation that callers to Babylonia's endpoints uh, see when they, when they retrieve the data from Babylonia. So, but in order to store the data into the Oracle database, which uses a rather different format, we have to have this translation layer that does a lot of complex transformations on the data to get it into a, a shape where it um, can fit into the row. And likewise, when you read it out, you have to do certain transformations to the data to get it in a format where you can return it to a RESTly caller. Um, one, one comment about this is that the, uh, there's actual data transformations that happen between the Pegasus object and the Oracle row, both in writing the data and also in reading it out. Um, and these were things that we needed to account, to, to account for in the migration process. Um, and one of the implications of having the data in this form in the Oracle database is that the, um, the data bus events were also in the same native form of the Oracle uh, records, which also were in the same form on the offline snapshot of the database, which meant that any nearline processes or offline processes had to be able to handle the Oracle row format, which was quite different from the Pegasus RESTly format that RESTly callers were dealing with. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is design this schema for the Espresso database to make use of the fact that it is similar format Avro to uh, Pegasus to make that translation layer that we had for Oracle be much simpler. Uh, one thing about Pegasus and Avro is both of them give the ability to define a schema in JSON and use the schema 
in the build process to create Java objects, which would have nice get and set methods, uh, things like that for um, all of the fields within, within the record. And there is even a translation method that can convert a Pegasus schema into an Avro schema. So this meant that we could actually write a Pegasus schema and use this as the format um, not only for, uh, for the RESTly calls, but also as an internal format in the, in the Espresso database, and also uh, this being the source for the actual Java objects that are being manipulated either inside of Babylonia, where it's Pegasus objects, or any offline or nearline process that wanted to handle the Avro records from the Espresso database. So next, next step, let's uh, uh, look at, what, so the desired where we want to be is that um, we have the records being stored in Avro so that this translation layer is much thinner and simpler and the records uh, that the offline and the nearline processes are also very similar to what the RESTly callers are, are dealing with. Uh, another comment about the advantages as far as schema evolution go is that in Oracle, when you wanted to add something to the table, you'd have to issue an alter table command, and it was uh, something that would happen independently of when you pushed code. So if you had code that, ne that needed the new column and, um, and the existing code that didn't know about the column, you had to somehow coordinate these things, these releases together so that the new version of the code and the new version of the database would be uh, available at the same time. And in practice, this meant that making changes to the database schema was very difficult. Um, and when, because it's very difficult, it meant you do it very rarely. And it's easier, for example, to add something to the table than it is to delete something from the table because each, um, the, data, the DBAs would say, we want your alter table to be somehow re reversible. So if there's something that goes terribly wrong, we can take away your new, your new field. But if your alteration to the table is to delete a field from the, from the table, then it's not easy to recover all the data that you've just purged uh, from, from the database. And on the other side, on the Espresso side, the schema for the document is part of the code. And you have an auto-registration process which updates the schema in the database at the same time that the code is being pushed to production. So it means that you can coordinate these things uh, together. And in practice, we write changes to the schema such that they are backwards compatible, so that you can push a new schema to the, to the, to the database, and existing readers can still read the old records and the new records, and, um, and those updates don't have to all be synchronized. So our goals for the migration process is um, we want to be able to do this migration without taking down the system. So the system should still continue to operate in the whole, at the whole time. And it should be transparent to all the callers to Babylonia so that they shouldn't be aware or need to make changes uh, coordinated with us. Um, we wanted to keep both systems running at the same time so that anyone who was still in somehow uh, dependent on the Oracle version of the system could continue to operate until and give them some runway to make their changes and wouldn't block our forward progress. Um, and we wanted to be, make validations at each step that we weren't making uh, a code path to the Espresso database that somehow was giving something different from what was happening with the Oracle. So here's the system. The next thing we're going to do is we don't need to consider the nearline consumers right now. We don't need to consider the offline consumers. Let's just look at the database uh, and what's the existing system. So pre-migration, we have a number of services that are all calling RESTly endpoints on Babylonia. And we also have a couple of services um, from before the days of uh, RESTly that were actually still making some direct calls to the Oracle database. Now we could Every time that there's something that directly interacts with the Oracle database, that's code that we need to migrate, and that is an opportunity to introduce bugs. So we want to eliminate as much as possible of the code that we have to migrate in advance by doing some code cleanup and some pay down of technical debt. So the first thing that we did was we identified certain RESTly endpoints and all those services that were calling the Oracle database directly and said, let's do some work up front to eliminate those 
uh, Restly endpoints that are deprecated, not needed, can be served by other existing Restly endpoints, and take those services that are calling Oracle directly and transform them so that uh, they will also use Restly calls. So this minimizes somewhat the amount of code that we need to deal with and focuses all the attention on keeping the, the Restly endpoints of Babylonia the main focus for the migration. So now um, we have uh, the Oracle database, we have the offline store, we create a new Espresso database. And we did this based on the, uh, as, as close as possible to the Restly format, as I mentioned, so that um, we now have an empty container to put our migrated data. Um, to, do the, to do the conversion, now we have to put data into the database. We created an offline convert job, so it took the snapshot offline and it converted it into the new Espresso records. And because we made them similar to the Pegasus Restly format, we could reuse a lot of the same code that we were already using in normal cases to read data from Oracle and put it out as a response to a Restly call. We could reuse a lot of that code to read Oracle records and convert them into Espresso records. Um, th so we used this offline job, we created a file containing all of the new Espresso records and we ran another offline job that uh, bulk loaded them into the Espresso database. Uh, this took a fair amount of time but um, was uh, not a significant uh, issue because we had no online uh, use of the Espresso database uh, right now so this was just getting us to the point where we started. So now the Espresso database is loaded with all the data. But we're not quite done because uh, it, since I said it took some time to, uh, to load the database, what we don't have is a fully current version of, of the database. We have the data as of the time of the snapshot of, of the database. And so we need to get the, the data to be not only up to date, but also a mechanism to keep it up to date. So for that, let's give ourselves a little space. We made use of the fact that we have this data bus event. So this is a stream of data change events. One of the features that data bus gives is that when it puts it into the stream of events, you actually get to keep some history there. So you can uh, start consuming events from this stream from any point in the history that is, uh, that is there in the window with something like a couple of weeks long. Um, and so we, we set the timestamp of where we want to start on the data bus listener and we create this listener uh, process that's going to start consuming those events from some timestamp somewhat before the uh, timestamp of when that uh, bulk, uh, bulk load, um, uh, that, that, sna that snapshot was there. And we replay those events through this data bus listener, which is again doing this conversion from Oracle to Espresso and writing them to the Espresso database. And once we finish catching up on all those events, we keep that data bus listener running. Uh, and what that does is that every change that is written or updated to the Oracle database now gets automatically mirrored into the Espresso database through the data bus listener. So the next step we did was we implemented in Babylonia what we called shadow read validation. This was a process where we would, every time we would read data from Oracle, that was the real source of truth data, but we would perform the same read on the Espresso database and compare because we want those reads to give exactly the same result. And initially we found some cases where we didn't get the same result and this meant that we had some more work to do in the, uh, in the translation part. Um, uh, but this gave us a mechanism to check that we invalidate that the data in the Espresso database matches what we have in the Oracle database. The next step, once we have confidence in the data going through the data bus, is we now try doing direct writes to the Espresso database. So we'll write to the Oracle database and then we'll write to the Espresso database and we'll continue to do shadow read validation. So now we're reading records um, if they've been recently written by Babylonia, we'll be reading out the record that was written by Babylonia. And because I mentioned there's a lot of complex transformations in that Espresso to, uh, sorry, in Babylonia to Oracle layer, there's actually some transformations that 
were happening on the read side from Oracle that um, that we weren't capturing um, uh, we weren't capturing from from uh, from the path. So once we directly writing, we we found some more incons inconsistencies that we also had to had to fix. This also creates a problem, which is now Babylonia's writing to Oracle, and it's also writing directly to Espresso. So it's really writing to Espresso twice. One path goes through Oracle and through the data bus listener, and it's writing the same record directly to Espresso. And this can cause a write conflict. Um, Espresso does not give you, or this whole system does not give you eventual consistency. What it actually gives you is last writer wins. And so the timing of who writes first becomes very important. And if you, for example, had a situation where um, Espresso would write, and then sometime later, the update to Oracle would pass through the data bus listener and overwrite the record that you just wrote directly, um, any problems that you have in those directly written records is not going to be visible, because you'll always be reading the record as passing through the data bus listener. So we figured out a mechanism to do this, uh, to, to control this, is we added an extra field onto the record, which we called the migration control field. And essentially what this did was stamp each record with the origin of who wrote it. So it could have been written by the bulk loader, so the, the bulk translation process initially, could have been written by the data bus listener, or could have been written directly by Babylonia. And since data bus listener is the one who we'd want to be the le le lesser priority, we added logic in there so that if the data bus listener was about to write to the database and it sees that Babylonia had already written it, it will, it will back off and it will not update the record in Espresso. That way we're, we're validating what we want to be validating. Once we have um, this direct write to Espresso and all of our shadow read validation is checking out, we can now move to making Espresso the new source of truth. So Espresso is now going to be, we're going to directly read to Espresso, we're going to directly write to Espresso, and after we uh, do the read or write to Espresso, we're going to continue to update Oracle so that all the systems that are hanging off of Oracle, either on the offline world or the nearline world, continue to have their source of data, which is kept up to date because every write is going to both, both systems. But now we no longer need the data bus listener. Um, but we need now a new source of uh, nearline events to replace the data bus, which is uh, an Oracle uh, for Oracle. And we have um, a not, it's not called data bus. We have another system called Brooklyn, which serves the same function. And now we have, a gen we have data change events coming from the Espresso database. Um, on the on Brooklyn, uh, so now it's the job of the people who are now the nearline and offline consumers to switch to the new Espresso ETL and to switch to the new Brooklyn uh, events. Then finally, we're done, and we can turn off Oracle once nobody else is depending on it. Um, so this, uh, I again thank you for for the presentation, but um, I will be available for office hours. And um, also uh, just mention that uh, I welcome any feedback that people will provide and also um, uh, welcome anyone to, uh, to connect over on, on LinkedIn. Put that slide up over here. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Yes. I think we have some time for questions. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Excellent presentation. Um, the last setup you showed with the dual rights, do you have any mechanism to enforce atomicity between the two rights? I mean, when you go to the Oracle database and I don't know, maybe there's a problem writing to I mean, Espresso? So, so one of the, that was a concern. What happens if you write to the Oracle database and it succeeds and then you write to Espresso and it fails? So. We resolve that by deciding whichever one is the source of truth, we will read or write that one first. So we'll let, if you write to Oracle and it fails, we won't also write to Espresso if Oracle is still the source of truth. Um, and likewise, once we switch to Espresso being the source of truth, if you write to Espresso and then you write to Oracle and if it fails, we'll just leave that 
as it is. And um, while we still had the full system with the uh, with the or data bus listener going, we had some. This acted as a kind of a backup, where if let's say we had failed writes to Espresso, but a successful write to Oracle, you could let the Oracle write go through and get into the Espresso database via that path, and it would kind of patch up if you're still not fully uh, ready with your, uh, uh, with your Espresso uh, direct write path working correctly. And I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> usually when you go from a relational database to a NoSQL database, uh, from a programming standpoint, oftentimes the syntax is actually simpler for simple things. Um, but for richer database interactions, you lose some of the power of SQL. Uh, no, I do not know much about Espresso, mm -hmm. but I was wondering from a, a productivity or maintainability point of view, uh, what's the impact of, uh, and I suppose there's no SQL on top of Espresso, uh, so if, if there was a pain point for some of the transactions. I don't know how complex is the domain. Specifically a pain point on that. Um, we did make some things, you do get some atomicity guarantees from Espresso, where if you have two tables on the same server that are working off the same key, that you can commit records to both of those tables as a single transaction. If they don't share the same key, then all uh, guarantees are off on that. And as far as richer interactions, in our case, Babylonia didn't really need to have more richer interactions, and we knew that, which is why we w this was a mostly win on, on the, the migration. Uh, but you have some mechanism mechanisms where, let's say, some things that we did want to do, we had some relational field where we had uh, re a, a list of keys that referenced to another table. So we actually created another table to represent that. So you would uh, turn the join of one query into queries on more than one table. Um, and if we needed it, we also is supported at LinkedIn with Espresso, something called materialized views, which allow you to do more complex joins uh, but that they don't, um, they don't happen immediately. They happen as a kind of a, um, eventual uh, process that, if, that you get another view on the, on the database that is updated continuously. Okay, uh, thank you, David.